academic conversations. We talk. No matter what gender, culture, nationality, or language, people talk. We are constantly engaged in molding the ideas of one another through affirmation and even disagreement. Chances are, if someone asks your opinion about a subject, you will have one, even if you don't know anything about the subject. Robert Ferber of the University of Illinois pointed out almost all surveys on political and economic issues, as well as on brand preferences and other marketing questions, contain a large component of ignorance in that respondents' opinions are dictated by prejudice or propaganda. Communication is fundamental to the human condition, but we don't always worry about the veracity of our discussions. We're as likely to respond to gossip as to fact, sometimes even more so. Politicians know people remember the negative more easily than the positive, and they develop campaigns to take advantage of that characteristic. We talk with friends. We talk in groups. Take a look around you as you go through a single day. How many people do you see in thoughtful discussion? How many conversations do you have? Some of those conversations are profoundly important to the development of an individual's world view. Others are no more important than deciding what to have for supper. Academics have conversations too. Whether one studies oceanography, architecture, literature, medicine, deep space, or any other discipline, the conversations have evolved over time, sometimes hundreds or even thousands of years. What distinguishes academic conversations from the kind each of us has each day of our lives? First is purpose. Academic conversations are more tightly focused and intent on revealing as much as possible about the question at hand. They tend to be evidence-based. The academic can make any sort of claim as long as that claim can be substantiated by sufficient evidence. They build upon earlier ideas. Example, MW. For a long time, people thought that hyperbolic space was just some mathematical abstraction. But at the talk you gave at the Institute for Figuring, you brought along a lot of hyperbolic lettuce leaves. We now know that there are actually lots of things in nature that exhibit this geometry. Lettuce leaves, kelp, and many different sea creatures, especially sea slugs, flatworms, and nudibranch. Why didn't mathematicians recognize this before? D.H. There were mathematicians who saw these things, but to think about them as a geometry, which is a very particular kind of structure, just didn't occur to them. We don't have to know anything about the subject at all to understand the conversation about hyperbolic space has been going on for some time. We can easily see, too, that evidence, crocheted hyperbolic lettuce leaves, has been provided in support of the new theory. So what does all this have to do with writing, and especially academic writing? The discussions we have with friends and social groups is usually fleeting. Our voices and ideas float away almost as quickly as we move from one group to another. Academic discussions, on the other hand, are frequently recorded in some way, whether directly or as an interpretation. Those recordings, for many generations, survived in libraries around the world, protected and venerated for their wisdom. Each generation of scholars has looked not only forward, but also back toward those who had already made discoveries and took the time to record them. If they didn't do that, each generation would be forced to rediscover what someone else had labored to find. So how do you join academic conversations? First, recognize that no matter how good your opinions might be, if they are not based on evidence, they are no better than anyone else's. 
the adage that everyone is entitled to his opinion is true, but it does not take any notice of whether an opinion is relevant, credible, based on fact, or simply exists because the opinion holder thinks it exists. Second, develop the habit of fact checking when an issue is important. There are far too many who are willing to lie for their personal or group benefit. If we accept at face value whatever our favorite commentator has to say, we are likely to end up with a very skewed concept of current issues. This is particularly critical in election years, especially in California, where the initiative process can result in bizarre outcomes. In 1998, Californians voted to make it a felony to sell horses for human consumption. Other states have done the same thing. Citizens were responding to emotional appeals claiming horses deserve special status because they were pets. Those who researched the facts of the proposition discovered there was nothing to prevent those same horses from being sold for pet food. Seek out more than one or two opinions on issues. It's so tempting to take the first two or three sources in a Google search and try to build a case around them, but doing that means one is likely to have little understanding of the nuances so essential to making a well-informed decision. Lastly, cultivate reliance on high-quality resources. Learn how to use the database subscriptions provided to you by the campus. Seek out the best internet sources. More about that later. The main point is to energetically pursue more and better knowledge. Then, jump right in and be willing to modify your thinking over and over and over as you learn more and refine your ideas.